1953 were locally acquired. This brings us to a current active number of cases in the Victorian community of COVID of 7,160. Sadly, uh, one person has died uh, yesterday, and that was a woman in her 80s from the northern suburbs in Moreland. And can I take this opportunity of offering our deepest condolences for that family and the friends of that person? Our thoughts are with them at this very sad time. 84% of yesterday's cases were people aged under 50 years of age. This continues to be a uh, overwhelming outbreak amongst both the unvaccinated and uh, disproportionately younger Victorians. 297 people are currently in hospital with COVID-19. 66 of those people are in intensive care units and 46 of those people are on ventilators. In regards to the cases that were hospitalised yesterday, 77% were not vaccinated, 19 were partially vaccinated and 4% of people were fully vaccinated. There was a bit of a, a normal anomaly in the that last number, you recall there's been an outbreak at the uh, Meadow Heights Aged Care Centre as a move a number of people uh, with large numbers of um, vaccinated residents. As a precautionary move, uh, a number of those residents have been moved into uh, a low acuity hospital setting. In regards to tests and vaccine numbers, Victorians uh, saw 56,520 tests delivered yesterday and through state-run clinics there were 41,029 vaccines delivered and uh, overall across all forms of uh, vaccination sites in Victoria, 96,000 Victorians uh, received a vaccination yesterday. 76.2% of the Victorian population over 16 years of age has now received a first dose and 46.2% of Victorians have received their full double doses. Just wanted to take this uh, as an opportunity to uh, highlight that uh, the state will now be uh, moving into Moderna and mRNA vaccination um, uh, type commencing next week. Uh, we are receiving 32,000 initial doses to administer through our state sites, uh, essentially to make sure that the tremendous uh, enthusiasm and delivery of vaccines through our pop-ups, which have been so popular uh, in the north, the west and the southeast, and right across um, particular at-risk communities, that we do not lose the momentum for having started those uh, pop-ups that we keep going. So uh, in that regard, we were very pleased to uh, allocate from the Commonwealth 32,000 uh, Moderna vaccines into the state-run clinics for the first time, and they will be delivered uh, in through our partners at Monash Health, particularly with uh, the Palm Plaza pop-up in Dandenong uh, and, if necessary, other arrangements in that busy uh, southeast area where we've seen huge uh, uptake in vaccines in recent days and weeks. Moderna is, of course, an mRNA vaccine and is both very safe and highly effective and is available in Victoria, predominantly through our community pharmacy partners, to anyone aged from 12 to 59 years of age. Uh, given some of the issues around Pfizer supply, particularly in the second half of October, we will be pivoting more of our pop-up sites in Moderna, to Moderna rather, in the coming weeks, so as to ensure that that really strong uh, drive of Victorians to get vaccinated in their communities, in safe uh, and accessible locations, does not lose momentum. 
Uh, we're focusing our initial supply around that southeast area for Moderna because we have seen such a strong uptick. Uh, and our friends at Monash Health are also specifically trained uh, in the delivery of Moderna uh, in those pop-up sites. That Palm Plaza site in Dandenong has administered more than 6,200 vaccines in just its first week of operation in the heart of Dandenong. Moderna as an mRNA vaccine is being used across all states uh, in Australia and we welcome the addition of this particular vaccine into the toolkit of the state vaccine hubs as another uh, opportunity for us to continually to ramp up our vaccine efforts. Of course, because most of the vaccines for uh, Moderna are allocated to the community pharmacies, uh, we would encourage uh, anyone uh, who has yet to uh, get vaccinated to either book into the state-run clinics, book into the GPs and the primary health care networks, uh, or book into the uh, pharmacy network. We, the pharmacies will be receiving more than 300,000 doses uh, of Moderna over the coming weeks, and those will be distributed across more than 700 pharmacy locations uh, in the state, starting off, quite rightly, in those high demand and high outbreak areas of the north and the west of Melbourne uh, and to the southeast. People can visit findapharmacy.com.au to find the nearest pharmacy that administers Moderna, or if you're over um, 60, AstraZeneca, and make a booking for that all-important first dose. In regards to the north, uh, which is, continues to be uh, the centre of the outbreak at the moment, uh, we've seen a tremendous increase over the past week in the number of vaccines through our pop-ups, through the GPs, through the pharmacies and through the state-run clinics. Uh, and in some areas, uh, uh, particularly in the west and the north, we've seen the gap between the state average and the uh, levels of vaccines being delivered in those communities narrow substantially. And indeed, in the city of Wyndham, we've seen the uh, vaccine rate actually exceed the state average. So it's, there is no shortage of enthusiasm for vaccinations in Victoria. Uh, and the key issue continues to be working with the Commonwealth to make sure we match supply and demand. Um, in the north, uh, we're also focusing uh, this coming week in another substantial pop-up at the C.B. Smith Reserve in Faulkner, which will service a number of school communities on either side of that reserve and the wider community of Faulkner uh, to make sure that the enthusiasm levels that we've seen for vaccines is, continues unabated. Uh, I'll hand over to the Chief Health Officer to give us more of a map of the outbreak, and then we're happy to take questions. Thank you, Minister. So just on the um, current geography of the outbreak uh, in Victoria, uh, the northern suburbs continues to see the majority of new cases, 58% uh, or 427. 243 of those are in Hume, uh, with 71 in Craigieburn. That's 10% that's of uh, the daily total. 58 in Roxburgh Park, 20 in Meadow Heights. Uh, the western suburb um, area has 23% of new cases uh, in suburbs such as Altona North, Tarnit and Point Cook. Uh, the southeastern suburbs are now accounting for 10% of cases. There's been an uptick there really in uh, the last week or two um, with 75 new cases, five in Cranbourne East, for example, and four in Dandenong. Uh, and the eastern suburbs, only 4% of uh, current cases, <clears throat> but 27 in total, um, uh, including in Doncaster East. In regional Victoria, there's, there's been a, a slow but steady increase in cases as well. There were 27 new cases uh, in regional Vic yesterday. Ballarat's seen one new case. Um, this person, unfortunately, may have been infectious while in the community. Um, we're looking into the, the possible source uh, for that individual. Um, a new case in Borbor, who's a known close contact. Three new cases in Campaspe. 
um, the source for one case under investigation and the results of two other cases are really, uh, <clears throat> including one in Moira Shire, are under review and being retested today. So looking at um, uh, retesting for the purpose of uh, uh, understanding if that result is true. <clears throat> Five new cases in Geelong, two are known uh, household contacts and the source for the other three is under investigation. Uh, two of those three are in the same household. One new case in Shepparton, believed to be acquired from a transport driver. One new case in the Macedon Ranges, uh, who works in the freight industry and may have uh, contact with a positive driver. Nine new cases in Mitchell Shire. One's a known household contact. Uh, one, uh, a possible acquisition from Melbourne. And the other seven uh, came in late, being interviewed this morning. Two new cases in uh, Moorabool. I don't have um, further details at this stage. Again, um, they were late in. Uh, but we have seen a number of cases in Bacchus Marsh uh, this week with links to workplaces uh, in Melbourne. One new case in Wangaratta, who's a household contact of yesterday's case. And two new cases in Wodonga, uh, who are household contacts of a known case. And so the Albury-Wodonga um, uh, area has obviously seen a few cases, but um, they are known contacts and um, being managed uh, in quarantine during their infectious period, so um, under control. Uh, Bendigo, no cases in Bendigo's numbers today, but we are aware of at least one construction worker from Melbourne uh, who travelled to Bendigo prior to that um, uh, travel ban for construction. They were infectious since Sunday uh, and do have a, a significant number of workplace contacts and some exposure sites, so they'll be published on the website, so please um, refer to them and obviously uh, we'll do extensive testing and quarantining of those workplace close contacts. And no new cases in the Surf Coast Shire. Uh, we do believe we've identified the source of a positive uh, wastewater result in Aries Inlet in Fairhaven, um, someone from southeast uh, of Melbourne who's visited the area. Um, and with uh, a very significant weekend coming up, um, my grand final message is, um, you know, tomorrow's a day many, many uh, Victorians, uh, indeed Australians, have been looking forward to, uh, some people for 57 uh, years. Uh, Richard Willingham, not here today, I see. Um, no doubt uh, getting informed for his uh, home celebrations. Um, everyone in Victoria deserves to enjoy the day uh, and I hope everyone will. But there is a curfew in place uh, in much of Victoria. We don't want to see crowds down at the Widden Oval. We don't want to see crowds down at Gosh's Paddock um, uh, after the match or on Sunday, either in celebration or commiseration. It is those close contacts uh, that put uh, you, your friends uh, and uh, your households at risk. Enjoy your fancy cheese boards or, or whatever uh, way you want to enjoy it at home. Put the barbecue on, uh, but put your iPad up, uh, have your phones on FaceTime, cry and scream and laugh and joke uh, uh, over, the, over um, uh, the internet um, to uh, connect with friends and family and enjoy the spirit of the day uh, in full. Uh, but remember, as the Minister said, transmission's occurring in households. It's occurring between households. Yes, we have a number of exposure sites uh, published, but still the overwhelming uh, transmission that's occurring is between households for people who are not aware that they're positive, for some people who have not yet developed symptoms but are absolutely infectious, for some people at their most infectious without symptoms. So do not go to households uh, thinking that I'll be all right. I don't have symptoms, it's just me, it's just my uh, friends and family, of course I won't transmit to them. That's exactly uh, how we're seeing transmission occur. So I want people to enjoy uh, uh, the weekend, uh, but please be aware of that risk and uh, don't be the person to uh, put your household, put your uh, mates and family households uh, at risk. Thank you. Thanks, Brett. Happy to take questions. On Sunday, we were meant to hit the 80% target. Are we going to reach that? And if not, when is it projected that we'll reach that? Um, so 80% single dose. Um, the projections are certainly within the coming week. And um, the more Victorians who come forward over this weekend to get vaccinated, the sooner we'll get there. So we would expect that um, certainly by mid to late next week, we'll hit that. And that's a fantastic achievement by Victorians. It's a, it's a stop on the way to 
uh, then 70% double dosed with further measures of the roadmap uh, out of lockdown and then 80% as the next step for double dose. So we would expect to see those figures certainly within the coming week. And it's a firm 80%, nothing will be eased, even a percentage earlier than that. I'm probably looking at Brett because he's the one that has to make the call, but it's firm on those targets every step of the way. Absolutely. The roadmap's been pretty clear that um, when we hit 80% uh, single, uh, we've already hit 70% um, single dose. Uh, we're on a very fast trajectory to get to 80% single dose and then following that 70 double and 80 double. And as soon as we get there, um, the next tick off of the roadmap to recovery kicks in. It was only a week ago that that target was set. What's changed in the seven days? Have enough pe not enough people turned out? Is it a supply issue? Um, we've seen a record number of Victorians come forward and get vaccinated over the past week. Uh, we want to make sure that that growth continues. Uh, we've, there's always challenges with supply. Um, we're working through those with the Commonwealth, but that's not a particular issue that's going to stop us getting to 80 as soon as we possibly can. This is the first, uh, albeit a minor one, it's the first trigger, it's the first deadline that we had set the in that road. It's, it's, but it's since we've had the roadmap. Oh, pardon me. So um, it's the first thing that people have been looking forward to, as you say, minor changes. How disappointing is it that we haven't gotten there? And did you underestimate how no, soon not, we'd get there? No, no we, we indicated that this is all, all driven by the uh, record number of vaccines that we've seen Victorians uh, get delivered into their arms through the state-run clinics, increasingly now through pharmacies, through the primary health care networks. Um, we're not disappointed at all. We've just come off a record week of Victorians coming forward to get vaccinated. Uh, this is an outstanding achievement. Uh, we can do more and we all have to do more uh, as, that in, as that enthusiasm level grows to get us uh, on the roadmap out of this arrangement. The more people that come forward this weekend, the sooner we'll get there. If it's been a record week though, did we underestimate how quickly we could get there? No, not at all. Uh, these, these projections bounce around based on all sorts of, all sorts of measures. Uh, uh, let's all redouble our efforts over this weekend to make sure that we get to that measure as soon as we possibly can. Given the five new cases in Geelong, do you still expect Geelong and the surf coast to come out of lockdown on Sunday night? Um, it's a matter for the public health team uh, as to how that works. We've seen um, a really, really strong effort from the uh, Barwon community around vaccines and testing. And it's always the story behind the, um, uh, the numbers, the locations, the exposure sites, uh, were they isolating, what their context contacts are. Um, uh, we'll have more to say about that once the public health team provide us that advice. And the sooner we can give the people of Geelong and the Surf Coast the certainty they're looking for, we certainly will. Have you had any more clarity from the Federal Government in the last 24 hours on Pfizer supplies into October? I understand they were saying it was going to be possibly today or tomorrow or in the meantime. Um, so we're working cooperatively with the Commonwealth to make sure that we have that certainty of supply going into October. Uh, I think, I don't, don't think it's a secret that there's a degree of uncertainty for the second half of October for all states and territories. Um, there's been material on the public record to that effect. Having said that, we've worked really cooperatively with uh, Lieutenant General Fruin and his team um, around making sure that those programs that we've now just announced for the Moderna, for instance, uh, we want to make sure that those pop-ups and those really effective targeted measures that make a high priority for at-risk communities, that we don't lose the momentum for them. Uh, and that's why I'm very pleased uh, that the Commonwealth has allocated Moderna for the first time to the state clinics, so as to not lose that momentum. Of course, we're looking for the certainty for the second half of October, as are all states and territories, because that's we need that for the planning and distribution, as indeed do our GPs, as indeed do our pharmacists. Just harping on one of your previous roles as Arts Minister as well, the roadmap, I believe, once we hit double dose 80% is when theatres and, and the like can open up again. 
those groups are saying that they obviously need to rehearse in order to open. They can't just click their fingers and be ready to go, and they've asked for exemptions to be able to, to gather and rehearse. Is your government going to grant those exemptions? So, of course, um, uh, we want to make sure that Melbourne and Victoria, as the arts and culture capital of the nation, uh, gets back onto its feet after a really tough 20 months as soon as it possibly can. These are sectors that closed on the 13th of March last year. Uh, and uh, very few have reopened uh, for a very short period of time. Uh, we're working through those processes uh, with Creative Victoria, with particular uh, companies and organisations, with our health team, to make sure that they're in a position when they need to crank open again when we hit 80, uh, that they're able to do so. These are challenges, uh, without doubt, because those companies want to make sure that their workforce, their actors, their musicians are all safe and that they don't contribute to a wider resurgence of, um, of COVID once we do reopen. And I'm confident that we'll get through those issues and that our vibrant arts and culture sector uh, will start to um, gather momentum. I think New South Wales is planning on having events with up to 5,000 people by mid-October. So. Uh, can you give them, I mean, besides the arts, I mean, the events sector as well, can you give them any indication on when they can start to reactivate? I'd refer people to the roadmap. Um, for all sorts of reasons, uh, a favourable allocation of uh, vaccines and a few other issues that New South Wales government, and good luck to them, uh, had a head start on the rest of the nation. Um, they're going to get to that position earlier. That will be a very interesting measure to, for us to all to to uh, have a look at how New South Wales go, uh, but I'd refer people to the roadmap, which is making sure that we have a steady, safe and sustainable reopening that does not overwhelm our public health system. Uh, we want to make sure that we, when we open those doors, when we open those events, that they stay open. And in doing so, that we do not overwhelm our public health system. What can you tell us about orders to reduce elective surgery from the start of October? Uh, so we've always made it clear that as the demand into our health system around increasing numbers of hospitalisation measures, uh, that we will uh, look at how we partner with different parts of our health system. Unlike in 2020, so far, we've overwhelmingly kept elective surgery going. Uh, not just in the regions, but in those hospitals that haven't been uh, the COVID streaming locations. Uh, we've kept that going. But we've always made it clear that as we see cases of hospitalisation increase, as they are and as they will continue to do, uh, that we will need to make adjustments to uh, particularly uh, non-urgent elective surgery, partnering with the private sector and making sure that dealing safely and sustainably with hospitalisations of COVID patients uh, is our number one priority. So what will happen from the 1st of October in terms well, of that reduction? I'm not sure if it's from the 1st of October yet. There's discussions going on. It all depends on the numbers. Uh, but as we've always made clear, uh, as we look to increasing levels of hospitalisation, we're not going to have our health system overwhelmed and we need to uh, prepare accordingly. In relation to ICU beds, uh, the Premier last year announced 4,000 new beds for the state. Yeah. In August, your predecessor, Jenny McCarkos, said that there were 1,556 ICU and critical care spaces that had been prepared to date across the public and private hospitals. And she said a further 1,300 would come on board in Stage 2 and 1,400 in Stage 3 if needed. What number are we up to now? So, as we, we get asked this question a lot, and the answer doesn't change. As the demand of hospitalisations increase, we have now in place, based on all the learnings from 2020 and 2021, not just in Australia but globally, uh, we want to make sure that as those cases come into our hospitals, uh, we have all the pathways of care. The pathways of care start with making sure that we care for people in the community and in the home safely, where that is the appropriate COVID positive pathway measures. And our GPs, our community health centres, our healthcare services are doing the majority of COVID case uh, support at home in the community. 
when we then go to broader hospitalisation figures, what we've done is, as cases increase, we've specialised in a number of particular hospitals that have got the right ventilation, the right staff, the right equipment, the right uh, systems in place. And as those numbers uh, grow, we then expand to other health services. Uh, we are confident that uh, the arrangements we've got in place will meet that demand. Uh, the arrangements that were put in place in early 2020, when there wasn't the appreciation of how to manage COVID patients safely whilst keeping our health system together, uh, we've learned a lot since then. I think at the moment, as I've released the, the number of ICU patients at the moment, I think it was 20 something, uh, they're in addition to the more than 400 ICU patients that are needed uh, for heart attacks, for strokes, for trauma, all those arrangements. So as demand goes up, the more than 4,000 ventilators that we have uh, here in Victoria will be ramped up to meet that demand. So the ventilator's not an ICU bed and you need staff obviously no. to, to man that bed. If we needed 4,000 ICU beds tomorrow, could we do that? Well, we don't need 4,000 ICU beds tomorrow. But uh, what we, what we will we need, do that if we uh, need... You know, well, as I've indicated, as demand grows, we will... Because demand is predictable, sadly. We know that the people who uh, turned positive yesterday, that in 10 to 14 days, which we didn't know in early 2020, that in 10 to 14 days, a certain number of those will require hospitalisation. We are more than confident that we will be in a position to safely care for those in appropriate locations with staff who are already, I've got to say, um, pretty fatigued and worn out after 20 months of this. Uh, they will be in a position to safely and carefully care for those people and we will continue to ramp those numbers of hospitalisation beds up uh, and um, I am more than confident that uh, certainly uh, the demand will be manageable. Minister, yesterday the Premier said Victorian residents returning from extreme risk zones would need to test and isolate for 14 days even if they'd be double vaxxed and having negative yes. tests because Melbourne is not an extreme risk zone. On what basis is it not an extreme risk zone and when will we become one? Um, I don't understand the question because uh, other jurisdictions uh, deem uh, those measures for how uh, travel arrangements apply. Melburnians um, uh, are already covered by particular arrangements. They don't have to apply to come to Melbourne. Are we an extreme risk zone, though? Is that what... Because the Premier yesterday said Melbourne is not... No, dead. I don't think the Premier said that. He was referring to Victorians returning home uh, from New South Wales and the ACT. So I don't think you can conjoin the two. What more do we know about the protester who's since turned positive and was part of the demonstrations on Wednesday? What do we know? We know that protesting against uh, uh, COVID-19 does not work. Vaccinations work against COVID-19. Uh, to pretend that something doesn't exist and then for that very thing to put you in hospital is a message loud and clear that protesting against COVID-19 is futile. Getting vaccinated against COVID-19 is the only thing that we would encourage people to do as opposed to protesting. Yeah, epidemiologists have said it's too soon to see the full impacts of this super spreader event. So when do you think we'll be able to see the full impact of what this will have on well, our community? Well, um, those same epidemiologists um, quite rightly point that you might not have a full picture until maybe next week or indeed the week after. Uh, sadly, this one person who will be uh, treated uh, with the same level of high care and commitment to recovery that any Victorian who enters our public health system uh, is entitled to. I just think there is a very clear message to everyone who thinks this is not real. This is real uh, and it can put you in hospital, it can affect your family, it can affect your community, it can affect you. Uh, and the best thing that you can do is not protest against it, not deny it's real. The best thing you can do is to go out and get vaccinated uh, and do your bit to protect yourself and get us on that roadmap to reopening. Is your understanding that that person is denying that they have COVID? Uh, that's not my understanding. Um, 
you've got it or you haven't. Um, the science doesn't lie. People can um, subject themselves to all sorts of delusions, uh, but if you've got COVID, it is a very serious issue. And this person is so unwell that they've had to be hospitalised. Speaking of, at how, what level of unwell are we talking? Are they I, needing a ventilator? Are they in ICU? No, I, I, I don't have that information. And if I did, I, uh, for the sake of privacy, no matter which of our um, hospitalised uh, COVID patients, we wouldn't be releasing them. Is there a real danger here considering it's... That, do you think there's a danger here considering it's an anti-vaccination protest that it could spread among lots of people and they're not going to go and get tested. Of course, of course we're worried. That's exactly what super spreader events um, make us very concerned about. Not just for uh, the ill-advised protesters, but think about the Victorian police members who have had to put themselves in harm's way uh, to protect the rest of us. Think about those Victoria police members' families. Think about uh, all of the other risks that this ill-advised uh, behaviour is threatening to achieve the direct opposite of what they proclaim to be their goals. More cases prolongs, prolongs the public health measures. Vaccines and vaccinations shorten it. Make the right choice, get vaccinated. The Premier has previously said a lot of people attending these events, to your point, won't come forward and get tested. So how concerned are you about undetected cases in Very the community concerned. and how many are we talking? Well, we don't know, do we? Yes. Um, uh, uh, as the Burnett modelling talks about, sometimes you can be lucky, sometimes you can be unlucky in particular events. But that is why the public health orders do not permit these kind of uh, gatherings uh, at this time. Of course there will be a time uh, when we emerge from this for protests and for issues around uh, how concerns, um, however so arrived at, can be dealt with. But in the middle of a global pandemic outbreak that threatens these events being super spreader events that will make you ill, your family, your friends and your community uh, prolong the very measures that you say you are protesting against, that is so ill-advised. The smartest thing to do is to get vaccinated. And if you have been at those events and you do show any symptoms, go and get tested because the longer you delay, the sicker you might well become. Speaking of vaccinations... Long ...testing sites have been vandalised. Yes. Are you able to tell us what's happened there if those sites are back up and running? I'm not sure of the exact number, but there were some graffiti attacks on a number of Barwon Health... at least one Barwon Health uh, facility that um, were just, again, silly, ill-advised and, frankly, um, uh, just dumb. The thing to do if you're in Barwon or if you're in Melbourne or if you're anywhere in Victoria or Australia is to use the opportunity at these testing sites to make sure that we stay ahead of the virus outbreak and if it's a vaccination centre, go and get vaccinated. Given the, the protester that we're talking about here, did that person volunteer the information that they had been to the protest on Wednesday I'm or not, how did we confirm? I'm not sure of the complete details but... Uh, the health service um, rightly advised the Department of Health uh, of those particular circumstances upon presentations, as they do. People are quizzed as to their movements, uh, the contact tracing teams are engaged, uh, and that information came through those normal channels. Ash, have we had any cases linked back to the demonstration we saw last Saturday as well? Not that I'm aware of, uh, but again, it's in a in a kind of incubation sense, not that I'm an epidemiologist or a clinician, but um, it's still um, quite possible. Given they're targeting vaccination centres now, are you concerned it might impact the rollout at all? Absolutely. We've already seen uh, the behaviour of these um, uh, so-called uh, freedom fighters uh, degenerate to the point where they're so brave and strong that they abuse uh, vaccination centre workers uh, who are out there supporting the most vulnerable in our community for vaccination programs. These same heroes of Australian uh, culture urinate and smash up garbage all around the shrine of remembrance. These are not heroes. These people uh, uh, just need to pull their heads in and get on with supporting the wider Victorian community who they have essentially slapped their faces with their denialism and their 
poor, rude uh, and offensive behaviour. What we need to do is to uh, get engaged uh, through supporting the roadmap. And the best thing you can do is to get vaccinated uh, and if you show any signs of illness, go and get tested. Do not vandalise public health equipment. Do not stop your fellow citizens from doing the right thing and going out and getting vaccinated. This is abhorrent behaviour and it needs to stop uh, and Victoria Police are out there to ensure that happens. They have vowed to be out in full force daily getting their message heard about anti-mandatory vaccines. Uh, what's the government? We've seen the numbers now? dwindle. Yeah. We this saw we time. saw 90 plus thousand people get vaccinated yesterday. Uh, we saw uh, dozens and dozens of arrests. Uh, these so-called freedom fighters are losing oxygen every day because the Victorian community does not support their behaviour. The Victorian community want to get on to get over the other side of this by working on the roadmap, by getting to the levels of vaccinations as soon as we can. Vandalising centres, uh, abusing healthcare workers, uh, desecrating places of remembrance such as the shrine. This is not what makes Australia and Victoria a special place. Those people are unrepresentative. The people who are representative of Australia and our best shared values are those people who are going out and getting vaccinated at record levels. We've seen, what is it, 20% of 12 to 16 year olds in less than two weeks come forward and get vaccinated. We're seeing figures of over 80 and 90% uh, in the older age groups. In those hotspot areas of the north and the west, we are seeing record weekly increases, week on week, of vaccination centres. That is about what the best Australian values are, not these unrepresentative folk who really uh, just need to desist uh, and go and get vaccinated. Minister Josh Frydenberg, Federal Treasurer, was talking this morning about um, financial support to Victoria. He was saying that the Federal Government's putting in twice the amount the state is on households and business support. He said New South Wales didn't get a better deal on construction support specifically. Is it still the Victorian government's position that New South Wales got a better deal and why not top up and fund construction yourselves? Well, we are funding construction ourselves um, uh, significantly. The deal is that uh, New South Wales had, who had, if my memory serves me correct, a two week shutdown, is that the Commonwealth funded half of the business support and the state funded half of the business support. Victoria is prepared and is funding half of that business support. I'm pretty sure that um, uh, this is just another example, sadly, of how the Commonwealth Government seeks to prioritise, for whatever reason, uh, the interests of New South Wales as opposed to Victoria. All we want is the same deal. Construction in Victoria is shut on public health grounds. Construction in New South Wales was shut on public health grounds. Uh, Victorian government is supporting those businesses with half of the deal that New South Wales also had. And it is just disappointing that the Commonwealth has one rule for Sydney and another rule for Melbourne. The allocation of Moderna to the state um, hub in Dandenong. Can I just ask why Dandenong rather than the northern suburbs? Because that's where we've seen yeah, a lot of Well, cases. most of the um, available Pfizer and uh, other uh, vaccines is in the north, overwhelmingly. Um, that's why we've seen such huge uptake, um, whether it's in the state-run clinics, the various pop-ups, and through negotiations with the Commonwealth, the priority rollouts of both the community pharmacies and the extra GPs who have come online. When you see uh, the, the levels of increase of over nearly 10% week on week, uh, that's where the majority have gone. In terms of the South East, Monash Health are leading the, um, uh, the pop-up arrangements in that community and what we needed was uh, a set of clinical supports where the particular arrangements for Moderna were already embedded in the clinical participants uh, and uh, Monash were out in front on that. So it made eminent sense to just to uh, make sure that we didn't have to counsel any pop-ups to put the uh, available Moderna 
that we were able to get from the Commonwealth through the reallocations into the South East whilst focusing all of our other mRNA focus uh, in the North and the West. Can I ask you one more thing, sorry? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. sorry. Um, I just have a quick non-COVID question. Just on today being a public holiday, it's meant that traders in the city who are still open have had to pay higher rates to their casual staff still with minimal traffic going through the city. Should that have been changed and is it fair that given we don't have a grand final, they're paying those wages? Um, workplace relations are a matter for the Commonwealth under the uh, federal um, fair work system. Uh, those arrangements are put in place through the uh, system that the Commonwealth Government have in place, so you'd have to direct your question to them. Sorry, just a quick one back on the protesters, the police response. There's a video circulating about a, a cop that tackled a protester at Flinders Street Station, whether it was unprovoked or not. I just want your perspective on the police response to this and how so, you think it's been um, handled. Victorian Government supports Victoria Police 100% in keeping Victorians safe. They have been put in a really difficult position over the last few days. Um, including putting their own well-being at risk. Uh, in regards to the matter that you refer to, I understand the um, uh, Assistant Commissioner last night made some comments about that was under review and it wouldn't be appropriate for me uh, to make any comment that would be an issue that Victoria Police and their accountability processes will, I'm sure, uh, get to the bottom of. Mr Minister, just back on the public holiday, it's the state that declares when we have public holidays. Was yes. there any consideration to take away the grand final parade public holiday given we don't have a grand final here or a parade? No. Uh, Victorian workers are as entitled as the rest of the country to the average number of public, ho public holidays. Uh, that, that public holiday was taken away by a former government. Um, Victorian workers and the Victorian community are entitled to the same number of public holidays as everybody else. Chief Health Officer, um, protests this week um, started on Monday. Um, at least one aspect was mandatory vaccinations. The industry was given a week's notice or workers were given a week to get it. People in the industry have since said that there was a lack of consultation from the government and the public health team on tea rooms, which they say are more than just a place where people sit down. It's where workers shower, get changed, things like that, and also on the vaccines. Do you accept any fault in how it was managed and would you do anything differently in how you managed it if you had your time again? So the, the first thing about protests is, is, you know, this is not just about uh, being anti-mandated vaccination. They are anti-everything. They are anti-lockdown. They are anti the shutdown on international travel. They are anti-masks. They are anti-social distancing. They think that everything will be solved by taking a horse deworming tablet, uh, ivermectin, that gives, that gives you the runs and that puts some people in hospital. They are literally in a fantasy world. So uh, if they've taken mandated vaccination as a hook, um, uh, so be it. Uh, but let's not pretend that these are otherwise rational individuals. They are absolutely wacky. Um, the the uh, engagement with the construction sector um, w was largely done through Department of Jobs, Precincts and Regions, but uh, of course the public health team was involved. We have to move in an agile and urgent way uh, when we're faced with uh, rapidly changing epidemiology. Waiting a day can sometimes mean hundreds to thousands of cases down the track. Um, there was a prioritisation for construction workers for vaccination. It wasn't taken up at the rate uh, that we knew that we needed to see to protect them, uh, to protect the industry and to get the industry back um, uh, at the earliest possible time. The, the, the mandate is not dissimilar to New South Wales mandate, which also happened uh, in rapidly changing epidemiological circumstances and they did the right thing. Uh, in, in bringing it in because uh, it's made a huge difference to vaccination coverage in their most um, at-risk areas. To the extent that um, people have felt left out by consultation that we, it could have been done uh, uh, in advance or, or more so, sure, uh, happy to take those lessons on board. But there's no question about the urgency of it and the reason for a mandate uh, is when you're not getting the kind of coverage and protection uh, with vaccination that you know you need uh, in order to protect not just that sector but the entire Victorian community. We knew that it was driving a third of workplace transmission and that it was uh, uh, a significant percentage of all community transmission and was seeding multiple regional areas. How long are you going to wait until there's another town, another city uh, shut down because um, construction workers are unvaccinated or uh, otherwise not having their transmission managed? 
we're all we're all attached to tea rooms in one way or another, and and I'm not pretending that it's just about um, the opportunity to sit down and and have a blag with your mates. Of course, there are other elements that might be essential in a tea room gathering, but from a public health perspective, we know how transmission occurs when you're eating and drinking, not wearing a mask, in close proximity, and then with a significant cohort within a workplace, not just in little bubbles, uh, and you're in an indoor area, and that this is an industry where uh, a lot of virus was being found, you know you have to do something, and you have to do it uh, in an urgent way. What about in, around in terms of that vaccine mandate and how things have played out, not necessarily not forget the protest for a second, but there's clearly some opposition within the construction industry. Anyone could have seen that construction workers were probably more likely to oppose a mandate than other industries. The way things have played out, do you think it would have been better simply just to shut the industry, give them some more time, shut them for, say, two weeks or longer, rather than introduce that mandate and give them a week? Well, we've actually seen sentiment within the construction industry that's very pro-vaccine. The, the vast majority, more than three-quarters, already declared that they're vaccinated, intending to be vaccinated, booked into vaccination. Uh, another significant proportion of the remainder uh, just haven't got around to what I haven't declared. There is something like 1% who are vociferously opposed to vaccination. So I wouldn't say that they're um, fervently anti-vaccine as an industry at all. And it is unfortunate that um, they're kind of tarred with a brush that um, uh, paints them as some radical anti-public health measure sector. I don't think they are. I don't think they are remotely. I think the protesters are um, uh, uh, a hodgepodge, a bandwagon of people who are taking the opportunity um, to get their uh, uh, frustrations um, um, on the front page. Um, but I think largely they are just an insult to every healthcare worker uh, who uh, on this day are treating some of them uh, with the best of care in Victoria. It's a, it's a total insult to healthcare workers. I can only imagine how they watch those protests and their hearts sank at what they know uh, it means for transmission. For everyone who's hospitalised, there's probably another 10 infectious people in the community. Whether or not this is a super spreader event, we'll um, see a picture of it in a couple of weeks' time. But... Uh, these are individuals who, whether they're at a protest or otherwise, um, have kind of declared that they don't follow the rules. So no one in the public health team was remotely surprised uh, that someone would turn up positive and hospitalised uh, with COVID. You said you weren't seeing the number of uh, vaccine uptake in the construction industry before the mandate came into force. Have you seen that this week? Absolutely. Have you seen an increase? Absolutely. In their thousands. So, so previously, and again, it's not about um, being anti-vaccine, it's about not... Um, feeling the urgency that we know from a public health perspective is there. Uh, and and there, was, there were a trickle of individuals coming forward for vaccination, um, despite the fact that we also had that um, incentive, if you like, uh, for higher caps in construction with a higher proportion vaccinated. And so without, um, without blaming uh, those individuals, it just wasn't um, the, the level of coverage with the vaccine uh, that we knew was required as a matter of urgency. And yes... Uh, you could uh, shut down the entire sector, but you're not going to get that vaccination protection um, until uh, sometime after that first dose, and really you need the, the two doses. So um, that urgency of vaccination needed to happen regardless. How do we have been vaccinated specifically? I'm, I'm not sure in terms of uh, total numbers, but you know there would have been a significant proportion who were already vaccinated as el eligible individuals, uh, but we've, we've literally seen hundreds, um, if not thousands. We could get a clearer picture at some stage of how many of the industry... Yeah, to, to the extent that that information's been captured, people need to declare the industry that they're in uh, or their uh, job title, but um, to the extent that that's been captured... Um, because people have declared it, we'll, we'll uh, provide that. Realistically, are we not likely to get a, a full picture, though, until that shutdown ends and you've got workers filing back into sites and having to show proof? It seems like there's no other way to really tell. Uh, look, it is difficult uh, otherwise, but we know that we'll go through a process of looking at multiple um, ways that the sector will manage risk of transmission. Um, uh, vaccination's one element. Uh, will absolutely look to their COVID safe plans and make sure that they've got an attestation that those plans are, have been uh, fully developed and are being submitted, um, but also the compliance uh, with all of the public health measures that we know are really important as well, mask wearing being a really principal one. In terms of the vaccination rate, though, it, it sounds like we're going to struggle to actually ever get a full picture of coverage within this industry? So there will be a requirement um, for first dose coverage for those returning to the industry. So that will be an employer obligation to make sure that that's in place and we'll be 
uh, checking on that as well. So whether or not it's in the system from a, from a, um, a vaccine data perspective, uh, it'll be a requirement for the workplace and we'll, um, we'll have the employers uh, making sure that that's in place. With our overall vaccine data, look at, looking at things, obviously um, not making the first, I suppose, trigger or reaching that first threshold on Sunday, how, how, will, how have we not get gotten there when it is a record week of turnout? Oh, it was an ambitious target. We'll probably be a day or two behind it. Um, so uh, um, everyone should feel good that it's coming, uh, that, that whether or not it's... Um, the 100,000 who uh, turn up over the next couple of days or the 100,000 the following day, uh, we will get there and we'll get there in short shrift. I'm just going back to the construction uh, question. Uh, any prospect of allowing vaccinated construction workers to return to uh, work sites? Prior to the two weeks? Correct. Look, I guess it's under consideration. That's not our intention at the moment. Uh, we do need that um, significant opportunity to both um, have uh, construction workers vaccinated but also to work through all of those other... Uh, risk mitigations to make sure that the COVID safe plans are there uh, and that there's a, um, uh, a gradual but very focused uh, return to, to safe workplaces. The role of Victorians are very much looking at your roadmap now, looking at those dates, looking at the thresholds and what each one means for them. We've got some models that, you know, COVID live, um, there's also another one that's being run by some teenagers, some very clever teenagers. Now fully, fully vaccinated yeah, teenagers or exactly, first dose vaccinated? Exactly. But they do paint very different pictures depending on which one you look at on, at which day. Can you, is there a scope for something to be coming from you? Can we have a countdown so that people know what it's actually looking like in real time based on the data that's going through your systems? Look, I, I guess conceivably, I think um, th there's always the danger that people are too concrete about a specific date. It does change over time. It's highly dependent on supply and then supply issues that might happen down the track. Um, and uh, indeed, you know, how people respond once you get above that a uh, uh, high level of coverage. We certainly want to keep pushing it uh, and expect um, really big numbers turning up every day. Uh, but we have to balance uh, how people uh, hook into those specific dates when they are clearly uh, in flux. But um, yeah, happy to consider it. Just on double dose rates, how many people are you seeing get the first dose and then not go on to get the second dose? Oh, it's a dose? very small percentage. People who've gotten their first dose um, uh, have a very high intention, 97 plus percent. And I think for the uh, two or three percent who who don't get it within the time frame that we're talking about. Some of those will get it beyond that time frame. So once we hit 80, 81 percent, Victorians should be fairly comfortable. Uh, first dose should be fairly comfortable. We're going to get. Oh, I, I have no doubt that um, as we hit 80 percent, we'll we'll go on to close to 90 percent, and that the uh, double dose stats will follow. You know, at that six week mark. Just on um, regional. Victoria, 27 cases today. In terms of vaccination rate in the regions, I know some of the big centres like your Bendigo's and Ballarat's are quite high, yep. but probably once you get to the smaller areas and I guess your assessment of regional Victoria in general, what are the vaccination rates like? If it's lower, does that make it a higher risk when there's cases in, say, towns like Campaspe um, that it could spread really fast? In yeah, of, cou of course it is. So whenever you've got a, a low coverage, low vaccine coverage, uh, LGA, whether it's in Metro Melbourne or in regional Victoria, um, that is more at risk for, for greater transmission. And uh, the contrary is when you've got that very high vaccination coverage, and I think the uh, borough of Queenscliff is, is right up there, um, uh, almost at the 80% double dose threshold, um, then, then you know that they've got these fantastic defences, even as cases might uh, come into those LGAs. So we have to review that. We have to be, again, uh, as agile and focused as we can be to make sure that we're supporting those LGAs and those communities that haven't yet gotten the vaccine to understand what the issues might be. Is it access? Is it opportunity? Uh, is it um, misconceptions about the vaccine? Or is it just the reassurance of having more information at hand or more uh, opportunities through pharmacies or GPs? What are, the, what are the chances of regional Victoria, all of it, going back into lockdown? Or do you think that we're past that point and you're just going to keep doing this local approach? Routine? Look, I think e every day that passes with more and more regional Victorians getting vaccinated is, a, again, a greater defence against uh, the need for a lockdown. There will be LGAs that get to that high vaccination coverage where if one or two cases occur, uh, we will have greater and greater confidence that they can be managed through the contact tracing process because they do have um, very high vaccination coverage. And so those individuals, they might have four or five contacts in their household, they might have gone to uh, some exposure sites, but the great majority of people who've 
uh, been close contacts are also vaccinated and have that protection. So we'll be, we'll be more and more confident as time goes by that a few cases in, in some regional areas um, will not necessarily require uh, a lockdown. I think that's, you know, that's, that's good news across the board. I have a follow-on question from that one, actually, just regarding um, concentration of cases. I've been told that, well, obviously, we know majority of Melbourne's cases are from Melbourne's northwest. Uh, I've been told 80% or so as to several LGAs in Melbourne. Do we have any idea on that concentration and if we could consider a targeted lockdown approach similar to what Sydney did? Look, the, the mobility within Melbourne is much, much greater for essential workers for um, uh, essential reasons to leave the home. It becomes um, pretty tricky uh, to, to have a, a lockdown that applies just to suburbs. We've, we've been through that at the beginning of Wave 2 last year. It didn't work. It didn't work because of that essential mobility uh, across suburbs and, and LGAs. Um, to the extent that we can uh, review each and every LGA across Victoria, we will. Uh, but I think we need to understand that Metro Melbourne as a whole um, has that significant mobility uh, right across. Do we know if 80% of cases are from several LGAs? They are, they are. And we've, we've um, published uh, some of the postcodes that apply in those LGAs, but they're the ones that I've spoken um, uh, to in part this morning. As to air purification systems, do you agree with Doherty Institute epidemiologist Jodie McVernon that the science behind the efficacy of, of those systems in schools is debatable when we've just ordered a whole lot to reopen? No, I don't, I don't really. Um, I think there's uh, always an opportunity for more research to be done. There is significant evidence about their uh, benefit and um, it's probably stronger than most other um, uh, interventions that are going to be in place in schools. Hand, hand washing, we say it's important, we're going to encourage it. There's no great evidence that it's uh, tipped the scales in terms of transmission within schools. It's not always easy to collect the evidence about a specific intervention in a specific setting. Uh, what I would say is that um, we've done research in uh, Melbourne and there is plenty of research internationally about exactly what HEPA filters do in terms of reducing the viral load uh, within air spaces and it is very, very encouraging. Uh, so I, I think it's an absolutely appropriate and um, positive investment uh, to protect our kids. It is not just about um, stopping transmission within schools to protect the families and the wider community, although that's a huge part. It'll keep kids in school. The fewer um, uh, episodes of transmission that occur within schools, um, uh, more kids remaining in school. I don't think anyone's arguing with that as, a, as an appropriate outcome. On people, no, 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 on people who've had COVID, there's some notion that they can't get a vaccine for some time after. Do you know what the rules are around that and how that will work when we start opening up, what they'll be able to do? I, I'm not actually aware of um, specific ATAGI advice on that. I know that they um, are keen for people who've had COVID in the past to actually get vaccinated. There is um, good evidence that it both um, uh, provides really good protection after you've already had uh, natural immunity from, from infection and, it, and it's an additional important protection measure because people who've uh, had COVID infection can get reinfected as we know. Uh, so um, to the specifics of, a, of an interval where they can't get vaccinated, I'm not aware of that, um, but uh, um, there will be a target guidance on um, exactly what the vaccination schedule should be at the moment. My understanding is uh, that it's the same as for everyone else. So if you've had, if you've recovered, you should just go and get vaccinated. You should absolutely just go and get vaccinated. And just on Follow contact up tracing, um, just on contact tracing, obviously in the last 48 hours, 1400 plus cases, it's only about 500 or so exposure sites listed on the list. How are we going with coping with the load and are we still listing each and every pot potential exposure site or have we scaled that back given the state of our um, outbreak? Yeah, look, uh, it's still within capacity with our contact tracing. We're getting to people very quickly. We're getting to their household contacts and their, and their social contacts very quickly. So that's, that's going well. In terms of the exposure sites, we are focusing on the real risk sites. If we were to list every single casual exposure site for uh, 700 plus cases a day, people would be lost in the information online and it wouldn't direct them appropriately to where the risk is greatest. So we're absolutely focusing on um, those uh, sensitive settings, if you like, and the more at-risk settings. And we're uh, being clear about the fact that transmission is going to be most at risk for your household and for your immediate social contacts. Sorry, does that mean then, if you've checked in somewhere that doesn't necessarily cut the mustard to get on the main list, would you still get a, an alert through a QR code 
system for those more yeah, I would we're, say, we're casual? Yeah, we're still working on that. Um, there, are, um, there are still benefits, obviously, for people to be aware that they uh, might have been to a site at the same time as a positive case. So it's not to say that uh, we won't follow up with those people who are checking in with a QR code um, and are potentially at risk. So we'll absolutely follow that. Is it reasonable then, like would there be some people who are getting a QR code alert that if they then go and check the list, it's not on there and that's because it was that lower risk but still follow what the text message says? That's right. Whatever message they get from public health, um, they, they should follow. I just need to do one more follow-on question because I didn't get to before, sorry. But 80% to two LGAs, that's quite concentrated. I didn't realise that was a confirmed number. So again, why don't we take New South Wales approach and let the rest of Melbourne open up? and just go back to a lockdown for those So I don't, know, I don't know that that's a New South Wales approach. Um, all of Sydney's in lockdown. LGAs. Sorry? When they were targeting LGAs, like they were having harsher measures for particular yeah, LGAs. Yeah, also didn't work for Bondi. So, you know, we, we need to take the lessons uh, both um, in New South Wales and in Victoria in terms of what the uh, benefits and risks are. Uh, you know, the, the efforts um, need to be concentrated, not the, not the lockdowns, in my view. I think our engagement, our communication, ramping up testing, ramping up vaccination in those most at-risk zones is exactly what New South Wales has done. It's exactly what we're doing here. And I think they're the best measures. Thanks all. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you.